Okay. <gasps> hey, good job. Are you back on? I know. <gasps> Hi, Cooper. <gasps> Hi, Cooper. <laughs> Hi, Cooper. It's the first time two-year-old Cooper has heard his mother. Hi, Cooper. Hi, baby. I know I'm doing that. I'm sorry. <laughs> What's that? Do you hear something? Yeah. It's okay. It's the first time he's heard any sound at all. Yeah. Life-changing moments like this... Hi. Hey, Solomon. Hey, Solomon. Oh, yeah. hey. Hey, ...are happening every day. Hi. And every time is like the first for Professor Graham Clark. That just makes me so moved. It's one of the joys that we've all shared with this work, and that is giving back people's lives, because that's what they say happens. Professor Clark's father was deaf. In the mid-60s, as a young research scientist, he set about trying to find a cure for his dad. That was part of his motivation. Another, those who said it couldn't be done. Colleagues in Melbourne referred to me as that clown Clark and they said that I was as likely to be successful as putting an uh, electric light bulb into a body orifice and switching on the current. So uh, that was a, a, ni a neat way of uh, summarising their thoughts. Hi, sweetie. Could you hear that? <laughs> Professor Clark's breakthrough, a device that turns sound into electric impulses in the brain, has allowed almost a quarter of a million profoundly deaf adults and children to hear. Oh, she she did it. Hey, Allie. You hear it? You hear, baby? New generations of that first device are now giving more people with different kinds of deafness the gift of sound. Oh my God. Was there a particular moment when you said, yes, I'm going to have a cochlear ear? Oh, my God. Oh, so... It was probably the prospect of motherhood. Round and round the garden walk to teddy bear. I thought hard and decided that I would be a better mother if I could communicate with my children better. Sydney mum Olivia Anderson's path to hearing is an unusual one. Born deaf, she resisted getting a cochlear implant because she'd become used to a silent world. Before you got the cochlear implant, you said being deaf was part of my identity. What do you mean by that? I felt that I was coping well and that if something was not broken, which was how I saw my life, there was no need to change it. But when Olivia had her first child, Camilla, her priorities changed. I just had a fear of her crying and my not realising it. So two years ago, Olivia had a cochlear implant. Olivia, are you ready? This is her switch on day. Oh my God. Oh, it was just incredibly bizarre and um, extremely excited at the same time. Yeah. Well, I'm speaking. Uh, um, you can feel it. the sound as well. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> big, big deal. What was it like to be hearing your daughter's voice for the first time? Can you hear that? Oh, you yeah. so It was emotionally overwhelming. Um, 
She squealed and started to start scream at her voice and just hear her baby stand for the first time. And um, yeah, it was something that that was so special to me. Since getting the implant, Olivia has had another baby. A beautiful big sister. A son, Noah. How many pigs are there? One, two, three. Do you wish that you'd got the cochlea earlier? Oh, absolutely, yes, without a doubt. I want to hear birds crying in the tree, on the tree. I want to hear people singing in the trees. I want to hear whistle. A whistle. Yes, when I play soccer. <laughs> <laughs> no one on the Solomon Islands has ever had a cochlear implant. 25-year-old nursing student Stephen Heskibo will be the first. A head injury, when he was five, caused Stephen to go deaf. He's learned to lip-read in four languages. In Australia, I know somebody like Stephen would have had hearing aids, he would have had um, deaf support at school. Um, he's managed to get through school without any of that, so to me, I think he's a walking miracle. <laughs> Find me two fella doing hearing tests. Annette Kaspar, a volunteer with OSAID, met Stephen when he came to a remote hospital for treatment. Moved by his plight, Annette contacted Brisbane surgeon Chris Q. He, who agreed to perform the surgery free of charge. Many large buildings over there. The $25,000 cochlear implant was also donated and Stephen flew to Australia for the operation. The external part of Stephen's ear is peeled back in order to drill into the bone and implant the cochlear device. It's a complex procedure conducted entirely through a one millimetre hole. Most people who are deaf, such as in Stephen's condition, the inner ear, part of it doesn't work very well, but the nerves that go to the inner ear that carry the messages to the brain are still working well. So if we can put an, um, an electrical device into the inner ear that can stimulate those nerves, then hopefully patients such as Stephen will be able to hear again. The operation took just over two hours. Two weeks later, in a tiny village, surrounded by his family, the moment that Stephen had dreamed of. You had him? Oh, excellent. Mm. Good one. <laughs> <laughs> the success of the cochlear implant has inspired the development of different bionic hearing devices around the world. Such as the one that 29-year-old Sarah Cherman is about to have switched on. There you go. It's beeping. So now technically your device is on. <laughs> Can you tell? Oh, that's exciting! Here, you can put it down for a second. Just get used to the sound. <laughs> what does it sound like? Oh, you're messed up, guy. <laughs> it was a genetic abnormality between my parents' DNA just caused it. It's the hairs in the inner ear that didn't form correctly. Sarah's hearing could not be restored by a cochlear implant, and she'd virtually given up on anything other than life lived in silence. It's all I've ever known, so it was just quote-unquote normal, but... Um, I mean, it's a struggle, just daily, daily you think of things that you wish you could hear or that you could understand. Mom! She's gonna go swimming. Sarah is married and has two children. Her life took a detour when her husband Sloan changed the radio station on his way home from work. 
I was driving down the road and I was I flipped to the AM channel on the radio station and I heard the back end of this ad and it, it hit me like a bag of bricks. I knew immediately that this was what we had been waiting for. The ad was for this, a different kind of bionic ear. While the cochlea has a built-in microphone, this device, called the Esteem, can actually restore the function to dormant parts of the ear, allowing them to process sound. But at $30,000, it was too much for Sarah. All right, can you hear the cracking? Until her mother-in-law, Larry, offered to give her every cent of her life savings. I wanted her to hear so badly. I said, do it, let's do it now, let's don't look back. So in August last year, with the flick of a switch... Can you hear me? Can you hear your voice? Sarah's silence ended. Does your voice sound pretty loud? Um, no, not really. Well, that's good. <laughs> My laughter sounds loud. Yeah, you'll get used to all of that over time. A measure of this miracle is that the video of Sarah's switch on has been watched 13 million times on the internet. What does a horse do? thanks to a single act of generosity from her mother-in-law, Larry. What would you like to say to Larry? To Larry? Oh, there's... There's, there's nothing I could say. Nothing would ever do it justice. Um, so I don't even try other than, you know, of course, of course I've told her thank you a million times, you know, and, but there's not... I couldn't even fathom cashing out thirty thousand dollars of my savings to give to someone. <laughs> so there's not any, there's not any words, there's not enough words I could ever say to express my gratitude. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't have a good answer for that. To be able to hear again has an enormous effect on the person's life. And it's not appreciated by people who have hearing. But to quote the people who have had their hearing restored, they say things like, you've given me back my life. That's it. Yay! We're listening.